Right, the room's still filling up, but I want to go ahead and wish everyone a very warm welcome to the first Third Coast Water Seminar of 2021. I'm Elena Harkness, I'm the Executive Director of Current, and on behalf of the whole Third Coast uh, presenter dream team listed here in the bottom right of your screen, I'm very pleased uh, to have you joining us here today. Uh, and this looks to be our largest Third Coast seminar yet, so really excited for all the enthusiasm about uh, solving our water challenges. Just a few logistics to go over. Um, if this is your first time joining a Third Coast Water Seminar, we do use the webinar feature. So you can submit your questions in the Q&A tab or any of your general comments in the chat to talk to other uh, participants and audience members. This event, like all of our Third Coasts, is being recorded. And the recording link will be shared on Current's event page and YouTube channel. And also, we'll send it out to all of you post-event. Quickly, the agenda. Um, I will be giving a short introduction to Curran and why we're here at Third Coast today, and then turn it over to uh, my friend and collaborator, Seth Darling, who's the director of the Center for Molecular Engineering and senior scientist in Chemical Sciences and Engineering Division of Argonne National Labs. Seth is going to introduce our keynote today, Dr. David Sedlak, and then we will make sure to save a lot of time for audience Q&A uh, before we wrap up right at four o'clock. Current is Chicago's water innovation hub. So we're the convening uh, organizer behind the Third Coast Water Seminars, along with Northwestern, University of Illinois, Argonne, the University of Chicago, and UIC. And we're all here to collaborate to grow our blue economy, which we think of as the uh, supply and demand of water solutions, to drive innovation and help solve persistent water problems faster. Current's headquartered in Chicago, but we're really interested in solving the global challenge that comes to ground right in our backyard. All of us can agree we need more healthy water for our homes and much less flood water in our basements. And that's our shorthand for saying there's global problems that are uh, felt by people all around the world, but we also care about how those are affecting people in our communities right here in Chicago. Things like water scarcity and water quality, um, the climate change that is uh, creating threatened coastlines, uh, not only on the East and West Coast, but right here on the Third Coast. Our problem statement is that people aren't rallying fast enough behind the new ideas and technologies that will create solutions to these challenges. We think that innovation is often too big or complex a problem for any one organization to tackle by itself. They almost always require some kind of collaboration and collaboration takes intention and effort. And that's why Current builds partnerships like the Third Coast Water Seminar and brings industry, government, businesses and the research community all together to try to push forward and take more rational risks to build new solutions. We try to be an unbiased advocate and we're much more than a connector. So Current is an, un an unbiased and independent solution scout. We like to stay on top of the latest in water technologies because we know this field is changing very, very quickly. We try to independently assess these technologies in partnership with many of the people uh, you see here today and a large network of others that bring their expertise to bear on these challenges. And then we recommend solutions either for others to try or for us to pilot ourselves. We're building a pipeline of water innovation and an evolving portfolio to meet all kinds of emerging challenges. We're working on sewage surveillance to use what wastewater as an early warning indicator for SARS-CoV-2, uh, looking for new ways to target and destroy um, PFAS and PFOAs, forever chemicals that are threatening our water quality, um, and figuring out how to remove and detect lead pipes and, and infrastructure that's threatening our drinking water. So these are the, just a few of the challenges that we're working on at Current. And you know, Chicago is our home and we're excited uh, to think about it as a very large campus uh, of water problem solving. And to that end, I'm gonna turn it over to Seth to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, and he'll tell us a little bit more about the big picture problems that uh, we all need to be working together to solve. So Seth, over to you. Thanks, Elena. Uh, so I'm Seth Darling. I'm the director of the Center for Molecular Engineering at Argonne National Laboratory. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Sedlak today, our speaker. David is the Plato Malazimov Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. He also co-directs the Berkeley Water Center. He is the deputy director of the NSF ERC for reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. He also chairs the Research Advisory Council of NAWI, the big new water hub funded by the Department of Energy, 
And I don't know if this is his official title, but I've heard him called the master cartographer of Nawi, which is one of the cooler uh, titles I've ever heard. Uh, David's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's won many, many awards, uh, including the Paul Bush Award for Innovation in Applied Water Quality Research and the Clark Prize for Excellence in Water Research. And I was introduced to David through his wonderful book. I've got my copy right here of uh, Water 4.0, The Past, Present, and Future of the World's Most Vital Resource. I recommend that reading for everyone. And I will turn it over to David. All right, let me share my screen here and get started. Let's see, there we go. Put it into presentation mode. Okay, good to go. Well, thank you for the invitation, uh, Alana, and, and thank you, Seth, for the kind introduction. Um, I've been following these, uh, these water webinars from, uh, from current now since they started, and I've really been enjoying myself. I think it's been a great opportunity to, to see some wonderful speakers. And following in the footsteps of giants today, um, I'm hoping to add to the discussion by taking a step back and asking a question about what we mean when we say that there's a global water challenge that we're trying to solve. My goal here is really to try to understand how research and development can play a role in solving these problems of alleviating water insecurity and advancing sustainable stewardship of this important resource. But unlike the other talks that you may have seen in the seminar series, it's not really a technical talk. Um, it's a little disconcerting to me because I'm, I am a technologist. I do research in water quality and I'd much rather be talking about reaction mechanisms or, uh, or, or kinetics or, or, or you know, mass spectrometry than talking about things like uh, politics and history and behavioral psychology. But I came to the conclusion uh, about 10 years ago that if we really wanna have an impact on the big problems related to water, we have to understand where they're coming from and why they're so resistant to many of the approaches we use to try to solve them. Um, I also know that if you're like me, you probably have a limited attention span for really technical work presented by way of Zoom. Um, so I, I, you know, if you're interested in the work that we do in my research group, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but not much at all um, today, feel free to, to, you know, to read those papers and get back in touch with me. My, my email is just my last name, sedlak at berkeley.edu. I love talking about the technical details, but that's not what today's talk is about. Today's talk is something different. I want to start out today by thinking about where I was when I started graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, just up the road from you all. Um, I came to grad school because I knew I wanted to solve big, important water problems related to water quality. I knew I wanted to be in the laboratory. I knew I wanted to be an environmental chemist working on water problems. But I don't think I had a very good understanding of the full depth and breadth of those water problems. But I got in the lab and I started doing things and I became more and more involved. And eventually I find myself as a professor at UC Berkeley. And instead of working on things like uh, advanced oxidation processes and hazardous waste treatment, I'm working in the area of water reuse. And through those experiences working in potable water reuse, and trace chemicals in those systems, I spend a lot more time talking to members of the public. And I realize how little they understand about the technology and how little I frankly understand about how decisions are made. And so that process started me on the journey that ended up with the publication of Water 4.0. It's a book that I wrote in part because I had this adventure that I'd taken uh, learning about why we ended up with the water systems that we have here in the United States and how they are responding to questions like water scarcity and decaying water infrastructure. And sharing that experience was my excuse. I guess it was my training to get ready to be deputy director of Renew It. I spent a lot of time uh, reading and talking to people and visiting places. And I think it made me better equipped for the strategic planning part of Renew It. And so when we started thinking about NAWI, the Department of Energy's uh, water desalination hub, 
I thought it was time to refresh this vision and to broaden my horizons beyond municipal water supply, primarily in water scarce parts of places like the US and Australia and Singapore and think about some of the big water challenges. And so over the past couple of years, I've been dedicating myself to learning more about the global problem or the global water challenges. And that's kind of where I want to start today by sharing some of the things I've learned with you and taking it from the perspective of a water technologist, someone who wants to do research that's going to make a difference in solving these problems. And I think you'll see my, my central hypothesis here is that if you understand more about the nature of these problems, the magnitude of these problems, and why they often resist our efforts to solve them, then the research that you do will be more impactful because it's targeted to the actual problem and it has a path for adoption. So let's start our journey by thinking about the six water problems. Now, water 4.0 was the upper left-hand corner, water for the wealthy. So in my own research program, and many of you who work here primarily in uh, the United States, it's a question of municipal water supply for people who have the means to pay for it. And so here's a picture of the uh, desalination plant that was built in uh, north of San Diego in Carlsbad. That was expensive and it solved a problem. Uh, and it's the kind of problem that we use to solve uh, water scarcity. Uh, issues in North America. And if you want to learn more about those, you can read Water 4.0, and that's where I was coming from. But I realized that there are five other important problems, and they're somewhat linked to this question of water for the wealthy, because technologies developed for wealthy people often move to other applications. Simply think of the cell phone, which used to be a toy of people in wealthy countries and now is ubiquitous around the world and has been reapplied and, uh, and, and used in ways that was never imagined by the people who were pioneering the technology. So you've got water for the many, water for the poor, water for health, water for food, and water for ecosystems. And I wanna talk a little bit about each of these different water challenges and then turn to what's driving them to become worse and then turn to the three paths for solutions. So let me start with a graphic that I have borrowed from uh, the Gapminder website that uh, Hans Rosling and his daughters created uh, uh, to explain a little bit about wealth and poverty around the world. And I, I really like this way of seeing things because it's helped me to understand um, the idea of that the world isn't really a place where you have uh, the wealthy and the poor or the developing and developed world, but you have a continuum of people living at different levels of wealth. So if you could think of each of these little, uh, I guess they look like Lego pieces in there, uh, as a billion people, this is how wealth is distributed around the world. There are about a billion people who live at what Rosling calls the, the level four. These are the wealthy people. They live on more than about $32 a day and they get their water the way that you and I get their water. They have uh, pipes and they have sewers and they have water treatment plants. And in most cases, they're able to drink the water coming out of their tap with great confidence. Um, and this is what Water 4.0 was about. But in addition to those uh, 1 billion people, there are about 5 billion people who I'll refer to as the many. These are people who are increasingly living in cities. They live on anywhere between two and $32 a day. They tend to have piped water, but it's often delivered intermittently. So there'll be periods of the day when they can't get access to the water. And something like 20 to 40% of that water leaks out of the pipes before it reaches their house. People in the group that I'll refer to as the many in low and middle income countries um, are perpetually struggling because their utilities can't collect enough money from their customers and the government loans and subsidies uh, that development banks push on them, uh, push them into debt and they, they just have trouble putting enough money in to make these systems run effectively. And finally, we have about a billion people who we refer to as the poor. 
And these people obtain their water um, the, the way that's shown in this figure here. Maybe they get it in a jerry can or maybe they, uh, they fish it out of an unprotected well or a surface water body. These are the folks that we talk about when we think about the sustainable development goals and, and providing access to safe water and sanitation around the world. Um, and they have a slightly different situation than the 5 billion people that we call the many because many of them live in rural communities or if they live in cities, they live in parts of the cities that are not connected to piped water systems. So it's a, a different kind of development challenge. So those are the first three of the water challenges. And you can see they're interlinked in some ways by the need to pipe water, the need to clean water, the need to disinfect water, but they're all slightly different based upon the ability of people to pay, the number of people and the way the water is distributed. Now, our fourth problem, uh, our fourth water crisis, if you will, is water that's not safe to drink. And I want to use the example of arsenic in Bangladesh because it's kind of the poster child for water quality issues. But I don't mean to imply that this is an issue that is limited to uh, people who, uh, who are not wealthy. This is an issue that transcends all groups. And you know, when we talk about like PFAS contamination in the US or even arsenic contamination in the US, it's certainly an issue for us as well. But I think the issue in Bangladesh is really compelling because it gets at the question of why these technolo technological solutions that we hope to develop struggle so much. So this is a map of Bangladesh and you can see that uh, the levels of arsenic in the groundwater are high in this delta. And the reason that they're so high in the, the delta is that the sediments that were washed out of the Himalayas uh, were rich in arsenic. And so when well-intentioned development groups showed up in Bangladesh trying to solve the problem of pathogen contaminated surface water, by giving people tube wells or shallow groundwater wells, they started exposing them to high concentrations of arsenic. And once it became evident that people were being exposed to high levels of arsenic, they looked around for different types of solutions. And so when you turn to technologists and you say, uh, we have millions of people who are accessing water through distributed tube wells and it's contaminated with arsenic, what do you do? And the ones that were chemists and ge geochemists and uh, water engineers came up with a variety of point of use treatment solutions, things that, that took advantage of the ability to absorb arsenic on low cost materials like bricks or iron coated sand or iron filings. And all of these technologies worked well in the laboratory, but when they were implemented or when people tried to implement them in the field, they often failed because of more of a social problem, an inability to create an effective business model for them, an inability to convince people that uh, going through the mechanics of purifying their water was worth their time and effort. And ultimately, the most potent solution has been simply testing as many wells as possible and finding the wells with high arsenic levels and painting them red and finding the wells with low arsenic levels and painting them green and letting people walk to the, uh, the clean wells and giving them education to tell them why they should walk to the clean wells. Now, like I said, uh, arsenic is not the only problem and Bangladesh is not the only place it exists. If you look beyond Bangladesh, uh, you can see that, uh, that there are um, about uh, 2 million people in the US who have high levels of arsenic in their groundwater. And these people pre predominantly rely upon wells that they control themselves. So it's another case where a point of use or point of entry treatment solution would be useful. Um, if you look further, you can see about another 200 million people are exposed to excess levels of fluoride. And there are not many good solutions for that yet. And when we talk about PFAS, we can see that this is a problem that affects uh, close to a third of US water supplies. And I think the more we look around the world, the more we'll see PFAS contamination. But again, the point of use and point of entry systems have been ineffective. And some of the centralized systems have been effective, but they generally only work if you have the resources to pay for them. The fifth water crisis is water for food. And the example I'll show you here is an example from India. 
Um, this is a, a plot of the groundwater wells in, uh, I, think, I think this figure comes from Gujarat, uh, where um, farmers were given access to, uh, to inexpensive pumps that could pump water from uh, deep in the ground. And they took advantage of that to use it to grow food like any, any enterprising farmer would. And this problem of uh, unsustainable groundwater use is a worldwide problem in part because we've come to rely upon irrigation to increase productivity. It's almost like people forget that the green revolution wasn't just about better plant breeding and pesticides and fertilizer, it was also about irrigation. So today, 40% of the world's food is grown on 20% of its land through irrigation. So irrigation is critical to food security. And yet in many places, we use that water unsustainably. So at some point, these farmers in India won't be able to pump water or it'll be economically inefficient for them to pump water. And we see that as an issue beyond India. If we look at the, uh, the, the Ogallala Aquifer in the United States, or uh, we look at parts of China, we can see this question of depleted groundwater becoming more and more a threat to our ability to feed humanity. And finally, the last of the water crises is water for the environment. And, and this is kind of maybe my, my cartoon charismatic uh, uh, water body uh, photo of the Aral Sea. And I think many of you are familiar with these famous Aral Sea pictures from NASA, which shows the, uh, the Aral Sea in Central Asia uh, shrinking and nearly disappearing between the year 2000 and 2013 as more and more water was diverted for agricultural regions and irrigation essentially upstream. Um, but the Aral Sea is just one example. I think that there, there are many other terminal lakes that are also shrinking, but probably more important is the impact that humanity is having on surface water bodies. So maybe it's not as easy to show someone in a series of images, but I think most of you are aware of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where nutrient laden water from the Corn Belt uh, is washing to the Mississippi River and fertilizing algae and resulting in, uh, in cultural eutrophication and, and dead zones. And you're probably also familiar with what happened in Toledo with algal blooms. And a lot of the, uh, the, the causes of those algal blooms are tied to things like uh, agriculture and, and other forms of nutrient pollution. And so it really is a crisis when you reach the point of fish die-offs and not being able to access a surface water body as your water supply. So those are my six water crises. And you can see it's not just one global water crisis, but there are a lot of intertwined pieces here. And I think as we start looking towards the solutions, you'll see the solutions are interconnected as well. But I think it's very helpful to think about them separately because there are different organizations responsible for responding to these problems and the way in which they're perceived by the public, the institutions that are set up around them are all a little bit different. And so understanding how to talk and communicate about that is an important piece of the puzzle. So six crises, and I'd like to now make the case to you that these crises are not going away. If anything, they're gonna get worse and they're gonna get worse in the second half of the 21st century. And I wanna start with that kind of thinking to by uh, reviewing these famous 12 graphs from the uh, Anthropocene. Um, if you haven't seen them before, um, it's a really important way to think about what happened in the last 70 years. So in the period following the Second World War, the, the world underwent what's been called the Great Acceleration. And the Great Acceleration was not just an increase in population and GDP, it was an increase in the number of dams, the amount of water that was used, the amount of fertilizer that was applied, and it all resulted in, uh, in different types of water crises eventually. So when you look at these, these figures, you can see that no trend can go on exponentially or maybe linearly forever. Eventually something's got to give. And that's the point we're at now where we see uh, places approaching the breaking point, but the momentum behind the great acceleration is not completely spent. So if you look a little more deeply at these figures, you'll see they're broken up in terms of the OECD or wealthy countries, the BRICS uh, 
uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and then the rest of the world. And you'll see that the population growth has shifted from uh, OECD countries to the BRICS and now to primarily Sub-Saharan Africa. So over the next coming years, you're gonna see tremendous growth in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and an increase in people uh, uh, reaching uh, middle income there. Um, think about it. Uh, Lagos and Kinshasa are predicted to have over 35 million people each by the middle of the century. So that makes the Chicago land look small and easy to manage by, uh, by comparison. And so um, this great acceleration, it really gives us something to think about because our goal in the coming decades is to try to bring about the great deceleration. We know that population momentum is changing and is leveling out in the OECD countries, will eventually level out in India and China, and even towards the end of the 21st century will level out in Sub-Saharan Africa. But it may be too late if we continue to use resources the way we do now, because people are gonna become increasingly wealthy and their demand for water and water-related resources is going to outstrip our ability to supply them. So certainly the dominant factor leading to water crises up until now and arguably for the next decade or two is the great acceleration and not only the increases in population but the increases in wealth that are being realized around the world. But in the second half of the 21st century, the driver is going to be climate change. So up until recently, I think the dialogue within the water community about climate change has been a little bit more theoretical. It's something like way distant in the future, you can see it coming. Well, I think in the last few years, we have the sense that it's arrived. I know for me sitting in California this fall, dealing with one morning when the sun didn't come out till noon because of the, the, the fires in the, uh, the area to the north and south of me uh, blocked out the sun, made me realize that you know there is something big going on and, and our climate is shifting. And I think for water resources, I think the, the, the clearest example that I can find is thinking about uh, the uh, ways in which the expansion of the width of the Hadley cells are extending the uh, extent of deserts around the world. And so this figure comes from a paper uh, on, on Australia, and it was an attempt by researchers to show how the millennium drought in Australia was tied to an expansion of the Hadley cells, which uh, pushed the, the winter rainstorms off the coast and uh, so that they wouldn't hit in their normal places and led to disproportionately uh, high decreases in water arriving in the reservoir. So when you go to Australia now and you talk to water resource managers in uh, Melbourne or Perth, they've already reached the conclusions that the climate has shifted enough that they have to find new types of water resources. And I think all of the arid parts of the world that are on the edge of Hadley cells are gonna see this expansion in the future. So along with higher temperatures and greater evapotranspiration, there'll be changing uh, water winter patterns of uh, storms. There'll be melting of glaciers in places like Peru, uh, a decrease in the snowpack in places like the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas. And all of this is going to make it more challenging for our cities to obtain water and for us to send water to agriculture. And I think this will accelerate in the second half of the 21st century, just as some of the pressures from population growth and development start to decelerate. So we have like a double whammy where even though uh, maybe we'll make it through the great acceleration, the acceleration in climate change will really pick up steam uh, in the coming decades. That's pretty much a bummer, isn't it? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to depress you. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's too early in the year to be totally depressed. So I wanna turn my attention then to the solutions. And I wanna talk about what I see as the three paths to solving these problems. So the first path is a soft path. And we call it the soft path because we see a lot of inspiration in the energy sector. So this book, which came out in the late seventies by Amory Lovins uh, of the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, posited the idea that the way in which we make an energy transition is by following the soft path of policy changes and energy efficiency. And I think if you've lived through these last uh, 30 or 40 years, you'll see that Avery Lovins was uh, prescient in his view of the way in which we'd address energy. 
First, we do it by energy efficiency. So the cars driving on the roads now are a lot more efficient than the ones that were there when, when Lovins was writing this book in, in the late 70s. And I think that is very inspirational when you think about solving water problems is that you have this immediate ability to use efficiency to make your resources go further. And this hasn't been lost on the water community. In 2003, uh, my Berkeley neighbor, Peter Glick, published this paper in Science on soft path solutions for water. And I think that Glick was right in saying that, you know, one place we should be looking hard for uh, problem solving in the water space is the soft path, the path of making our water use more efficient. Now, as I'll try to show you in the next few slides, it's a little more complicated than people often uh, explain it to be. So I think it's, it's worth digging in a little bit. So let me start with energy. Um, I don't know if you, you know who this fellow is here. This is Art Rosenfeld. He was a, a, a Berkeley professor um, and, in, when, and he was a high energy physicist. But when the energy crisis hit in the 70s, he decided that rather than continuing to work on esoteric research, he turned his attention to energy efficiency. And he worked and helped set up the California Energy Commission. And you can see the impact of the work of Rosenfeld and his colleagues when you look at per capita electricity use comparing California to the rest of the US. Somehow in the period after the oil embargo, uh, California's per capita electricity use has remained flat while the rest of the country's almost doubled. And that's because of the, uh, the soft path solutions that were pursued aggressively in California. So let's think about water use efficiency. Let's think in terms of urban water use efficiency, because I think it's something that like we can all wrap our minds around easily because we live in cities and we use water in our homes. And check out this, this, this uh, graphic here on per capita residential water use, comparing Europe, uh, uh, United States, Asia Pacific and Latin America. So the first thing you see is like, oh my goodness, New York and Los Angeles and Phoenix, they could solve their water problems if they could just bring per capita use down to where we have it in a typical European city. Then you say, well, why is San Francisco so much better than those other cities? And then you look at Asia and you say, well, Sydney and Melbourne aren't all that different from North American cities. What's going on here? So the first kind of take home message is that Los Angeles and, uh, and Seattle and, and, and it, a lot of other cities are never gonna reach the levels that we see in places like Brussels and Madrid. And that's because of the density of cities. So in Western US cities, about half of the water is used outside. And when you try to reduce outdoor water use, you end up having something, anyone here remember uh, what Walter White's house looked like in Breaking Bad with the rocks and cactuses? That's what you end up with. So people don't wanna do that. So we're going to continue to use water outdoors and, and we're going to continue to have different demographics, which means there are more young people. So people are fairly old in a lot of these European cities. And so the per capita water use is tied to demographics and age, but there is a lot of room for improving water use in North America. And that's what we've been doing over the past two decades. We see uh, places like Atlanta and San Francisco dropping their water use and not having to build new, new water supplies, not having to build a desal plant or something like that because of water use efficiency. So I think someday we'll get to be like uh, Sydney or Melbourne in most North American cities that are under water stress. Maybe New York will never be there because they have such an ample water supply coming from the Catskills. Uh, if you look a little deeper at some of the other uh, cities here, you'll see middle income cities. Remember uh, water for the many? So Mexico City might be one of those middle income cities. And you see Mexico City, which has some of the most energy intensive water in the world. It's probably about uh, two times the energy use of a desalination plant to get water up and over the mountains and into Mexico City. And yet people in Mexico City, where they're not particularly wealthy, are using somewhere around 300 liters per person per day. Why is that? Well, it has to do with a long-standing history of government policies that favored cheap water and an inability of a lot of the people living in Mexico City to pay the full price of water. 
And so if you wanna find solutions for Mexico City, you have to understand the, uh, the real history that they've come through and the way decisions are made by groups like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank and the way in which utilities struggle to remain financially solvent. And with that, you could go really far. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide and I'm gonna move on to agriculture and talk about uh, the soft path for agriculture. So I thought it was appropriate talking to people in Chicago to, to talk about corn. Uh, and this is a really interesting figure to me because it shows that uh, what happened during the green revolution to corn yields in, uh, in uh, the US, mainly in the Midwest, you can see uh, a factor of four increase in corn production per acre. And that's through better plant breeding and better husbandry of the plants, better timing of irrigation, better application of fertilizers. And that was the way in which we were able to meet rising food demands. And so when we think about the upcoming stress on food systems, we're going to have to grow 70% more food over the next 20 years to feed the world's growing population and their increasing hunger for meat and other water intensive foods. And part of the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna continue this agricultural revolution that leads to higher crop yields. So when you think about it from the standpoint of a technologist and opportunities for R&D, maybe that isn't us, maybe that's biotech people, but maybe there is a role for us in thinking about how precision agriculture may involve more efficient application of water. And speaking of more efficient application of water, I think I just wanted to end my discussion of the soft path by talking about one of the hazards of the soft path, and that is the unintended consequences that come along with it. This figure shows uh, the transition in the Western United States from gravity irrigation, basically uh, applying water through floods and furrows through fields to sprinklers. And sprinklers are uh, about 30% more efficient than, uh, than flood irrigation when it comes to water use. And we made that transition in the period from 1984 to 2013, and we greatly increased the yield of crops, but we had almost no impact on the amount of water that was pumped out of those stressed aquifers in the middle of the country. And that's because we, adopted the mantra of more crop per drop and not less water taken out of the environment. So the soft path really needs people to define what the objective is, or we end up producing more food, which is wonderful, but not leaving more water in the environment. Now you're technologists here, I don't wanna to get too lost. I could talk for a long time about the soft path. So let's turn our attention to the hard path. Now for us, I'd say that the hard path has this uh, uh, watershed moment in it during President Kennedy's 1961 State of the Union Address, where he touted the possibility of investing a lot of money in seawater desalination as a way to solve some of the world's uh, uh, pressing problems. And even though Kennedy got wrapped up in the space program, which used up a lot of his R&D funding shortly after this speech, um, he did manage to fund the Office of Saline Research. And the Office of Saline Research, as many of you know, had a big role in the invention of the, uh, of the reverse osmosis uh, membrane, or rather the cellulose acetate uh, reverse osmosis membrane. And now here we are uh, 50, 70 years later, reaping the benefits of those inventions. Cause you see worldwide seawater desalination capacity doubling almost every 10 years. So currently desalination provides about enough water for 300 million people, mainly in countries in the Arab world or Israel or even the US and China, but it's growing quickly and it's growing quickly, partly because of water scarcity due to growth, but partly because the price keeps coming down as the industry matures. The other hard path solution that I think is quite interesting to us all is the idea of potable water reuse. So I made this figure to try to illustrate where in the world people are taking their sewage effluent and turning it back into drinking water. And I put a flag next to each of these places and I scaled the size of the flag to the size of the project. 
And I made this figure um, sometime before November, so I wasn't sure if I needed a separate flag for California from the rest of the United States. Uh, turns out I probably don't, but I also wanted to, uh, to emphasize the fact that much of the desalination or rather the reuse capacity uh, in the United States resides in California in places like Orange County. Uh, but you can see that the US is the worldwide leader in uh, potable water reuse. And currently, when you add this all up, it's about 10 to 20 million people who are getting their water from, uh, from that desalination. And uh, it's, about, it's only about 5% of the number of people who are accessing seawater desalination. So there's a lot of room for growth here if we can find a path to adoption and a way to lower the cost. And finally, in terms of brackish water, and brackish water desalination, um, the United States is sitting on top of vast resources of brackish groundwater. So in some places in the middle of the country, it's at pretty shallow depths. And the technology for accessing that brackish water exists. But when you look about at the places where people are actually using uh, technologies, whether they're reverse osmosis or CDI uh, or other technologies to uh, treat brackish water and use that as a municipal water supply, you'll see that they're mainly on the coasts and they're in places where surface waters have undergone sal uh, salinization and that we have a tremendous opportunity in the middle of the country to start accessing brackish groundwater. And I think one of the things that now we're struggling with is we know how to get the groundwater and we know how to treat it we're not exactly sure what to do with all the salts. So this problem of inland desalination and brine management is key. Now taking these three innovations, reverse osmosis, uh, brackish water desal, and, uh, and, uh, and seawater desal, and putting them together, we can start thinking about what they could mean to low and middle income countries. So I made this plot here, where I plotted the size of various water stress cities, versus their per capita GDP. And the ones at the top, the ones in uh, dark blue and light blue and gray are places that have either adopted seawater desalination or potable water reuse, mainly in North America and the Middle East, but a few in Australia uh, and, and, and Singapore's on there too. And you can see they're all rich places. And then you see the rest of these cities here, places like, uh, like Athens and Istanbul, which is running out of water now, and Mexico City. Um, and these middle income cities, they're just not quite as rich as the places that have adopted it. So when you think about these technologies, if we could drop the costs from where they are today by 25 or 50 percent, suddenly there are many more cities that can afford seawater desalination and potable water reuse. And when you look at places like Bangalore and Mumbai and Jakarta, maybe you have to get 80 or 90% reduction in cost to make it viable. But you can see we're reaching a point, which is really exciting, where more and more people are gonna be able to afford seawater desalination and potable water reuse. And that's where the idea of NAWI comes in. So NAWI, uh, as you might have seen, is the, uh, the DOE's desalination hub uh, based at, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And you had Megan Mauter give a wonderful talk in your series uh, recently. So I don't want uh, to, to revisit some of the things that she talked about. But we hope that uh, you will become more involved with NAWI and that Current and NAWI work together and the members of Current uh, uh, end up being, uh, being partners on some of these uh, projects that get launched over the next few years. Now, if you didn't see Megan's talk, um, I, I think one of the important points of understanding NAWI is NAWI's A prime vision. And A prime stands for autonomous, precision, resilient, intensified brine treatment, modularization, and electrification. And it's kind of a way of thinking about all the different opportunities where if we could shave a little bit off of the cost of all of these different uh, water technologies, we might add up to something that achieves what the DOE refers to as pipe parity. But I've also been thinking about it, and in NAWI we've also been thinking about another approach and perhaps a more disruptive approach of uh, radical decentralization of water treatment. Because really when you think about reducing the costs of water by 80 or 90%, at some point the laws of physics get in the way. You can only be so good a technologist at reducing cost to a point where the cost of moving water and maintaining pipes becomes the dominant factor. And so we think a lot in NAWI about 
extreme decentralization. I'll just give you a quick example of maybe some of the most extreme decentralization that I've been thinking about recently. And that's this idea of personalized water systems. So I published this paper with my uh, colleague, Cornel Rabai from University of Ghent uh, last year in water research, thinking about how one could develop a, a home that can get by on like a closed loop water system using really just roof water and using all sorts of treatment systems and create something that is the, the, the Tesla of, of the water world, if you will, that suddenly uh, realizes the promise of uh, tailored water that meets the, the different demands within the household. So why not think about creating water that you like the taste of or where the divalent cations have been removed so your washing machine is more efficient or where the nutrients that come out of your toilet go directly into the garden through fertigation. So all of these things are possible when we think about the future of technologies. So there we have the soft path and the hard path. And the last path is the just path. And the just path is something that I think is a place where we need to start having some more meaningful discussions. Um, this is an article uh, that came out in The Guardian uh, uh, in June, talking about the millions of Americas, Americans who can't afford their water bills. And I think we're all familiar with this. This comes up over and over again. When you have water stress and water insecurity, you tend to invest money and in, whether it's soft path or hard path solutions, they cost money. And oftentimes there's an affordability problem. Or if you think about the environment, the environment doesn't have the same status as people. And so we put things into the environment that destroys it and, and don't worry about it. And I think when you look around the world, you see that not everyone behaves the same way. So in 2017, the, uh, the New Zealand constitution allowed the Maori people uh, to uh, initiate a lawsuit which had a river classified as a living being with rights and it had legal water rights not to be polluted. And you say, well, that's far-fetched. That's another country. That's another legal system. But the same thing exists in America. We have something, uh, a form of law that we inherited from English common law called the public trust. And the public trust doctrine was the basis for the Mono Lake Committee's prevailing over Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to stop taking water, uh, as much water out of Mono Lake. And, um, and is the basis for the water levels in Mono Lake returning to some of their more historic levels. And we think that as we think not only about uh, our obligation to uh, people who don't have as much money, but our obligation to the environment, we can see it's part of a larger societal discussion that hasn't been had yet. The water institutions that we have respond to their customers of the moment and they respond to the laws that exist, but there's a need for a deeper discussion. Now, as a technologist involved in research and development, I think this is interesting, but I also think it's an opportunity for us as researchers because the environment is not just a passive participant in our water systems, it can be part of the solutions. So we've been involved in a research project on the edge of San Francisco Bay called the horizontal levy or sometimes called the living levy. And it's a, an experiment in using uh, a nature-based treatment system to remove nutrients from wastewater while simultaneously creating habitat that can absorb some of the energy from storms and protect coastal levees from flooding. So as sea levels rise and as the frequency of flooding increases, you make a natural system that can protect the community from those forces. And at the same time, under normal conditions, you're removing nutrients and pre preventing eutrophication. You can see an inset, uh, this photo of what it really looks like. It's, it's kind of a, a nice habitat and has a lot of public support. And it's part of a larger vision that we have of restoring the shoreline of the San Francisco Bay to its natural state, where instead of wastewater being discharged through long pipes into the center of the bay, it used to trickle out in ephemeral streams on the edge of the bay that supported wetlands that created habitat. So I guess some final thoughts before we have a chance for discussion is that, um, you know, I showed you this vision of the six water challenges or crises and the three approaches for sol solving them. 
And I want to leave you with the idea that no one solution is going to get us there. There's so many problems that we're facing, but most likely we need an all of the above approach where we look at the soft path, the hard path, and the just path. Uh, water use efficiency is a wonderful thing, and there are a lot of opportunities for technologists to get involved in it, uh, but it needs careful management. You have to think about the unintended consequences of intensifying agricultural water use or restricting the amount of water people can use uh, in their gardens and homes. Technological innovations like the RO membrane take decades to diffuse. So whatever you're working on in the lab now, think about whether it's gonna be useful three, three decades from now, because that's when the industry that employs it is going to be diffusing. And then finally, this idea of just water means that, uh, that we have to think not only about intragenerational uh, uh, equity issues and the, the, the question of uh, wealthy people in the US and their neighbors in the US, as well as people in the rest of the world who live on much less money, but also intergenerational, uh, people living in the future who aren't born yet, and the environment that they'll come to live in. And with that, um, I, I, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to uh, a discussion with you. Thank, thank you, you so much, David. Um, you really covered so much ground. Um, I'm wondering if you could put back up just for a second oh. your, uh, the six problems framing slide. Um, sure. I am juggling a huge set of questions here, but I want to go all the way back to that um, to ask about the transferability of technology across some of these different um, places, like the problem spaces that you outlined. Um, and I guess it's sort of a question about this idea um, of trickle down technology. You create it for an affluent place and it then can get transported to some place where the need may be greater, but the resources to provide it just aren't there. And I think the fundamental um, challenge is that deployment looks very different across not only uh, developing countries versus developed countries, but even within neighborhoods, within cities in what we would consider developed countries, right? So there's so much variability right. um, in context. So I wonder if you could just talk about, you know, if so much of the energy is going into solving water for the wealthy type challenges, what does transfer look like? And, and right. you know, I think we, we can agree that trickle down tech is not going to work. So first of all, I, I, that's a great question, Lana, and I do think Oh, looks like we've lost our speaker. Um, that's a first. Let's give him one second to just uh, hopefully join us again. Because I'm not going to answer that question. I was just going to frame it. <laughs> Let's give him one more second. And in the meantime, uh, please do keep the questions coming. I have a big queue here and we'll see how many we'll be able to get through. Um, and I'm sure David will also be happy to do follow up. Um, I'm tracking exactly who's asking which question and we'll save all of that. So if we can't get back to you. Elena, one of the attendees asked uh, if the slides would be available as a copy. Um, the recording of this presentation is made available. So that's um, one way you can return to the material. If yeah, you're that's right. And we'll ask David certainly if he's willing uh, to share the slides with the attendees too. We do have an attendee list. So when we send that link out, if he's willing to share the slides, we certainly will do that. Let's see. In the meantime, um, I do want to take advantage of all of the experts that we have assembled here. Uh, some of the questions that I think have come in, I'd like to pose to you, if that's okay. Um, so one of them, we talked a bit about desalination. Um, and we talked about desalination in very different contexts, seawater, right, versus desalination in other places. Um, one of the big challenges with desalination is the energy use that it requires, which of course ties back to the climate change problem that um, creates these water stresses in the first place. So does anyone care to shed some light on this for the audience, just explain a little bit more about those energy trade-offs um, and how we can think about the value of desalination differently um, in different contexts? I'll take a stab at it and then maybe Marcella wants to jump in. I know Brian has to run to, to teach in a minute here. Um, so yes, uh, so seawater, 35,000 or so PPM parts per million of salt. Um, there's a certain energy cost uh, that is required to separate that salt from the water to make it potable water. And there's no way around that energy cost and it's significant. And uh, commercial industrial desalination has gotten 
incredibly good, very efficient to the point that there's actually not a lot more to be gained in terms of energy efficiency of seawater desalination. So it's already a very mature technology in that context, but it still requires a lot of energy despite all those uh, advances. And so at least from my perspective, I don't wanna speak for David, but um, it's usually one of those kind of water sources of last resort because of that tremendous energy demand. So where it makes sense is typically when you don't have another option, uh, mm -hmm. you're in a dry climate, um, and you know, there's not uh, surface water or groundwater available to you that's, that's fresh, then you don't have much choice but to turn to the sea and, and do seawater desalination. Mm -hmm. um, so water reuse, which David talked a lot about, could make more sense in most places uh, once we get the technology to the point that we can do that effectively everywhere. Mm -hmm. Great, that's helpful. Um, I wonder um, for those of you uh, that all that sort of live and breathe this every day. Um, the the hard path, soft path, just path. Um, which of those do you feel most optimistic about, given the radical changes to our lives in 2020? I mean, there's certainly been um, a lot of changes to the way that we think about uh, water justice across and, and justice across the board. Um, there's been innovation and technology advances, but I wonder if there's an area that stands out to you. I mean, I certainly agree with David that uh, the we need the all-in approach across all three, but I wonder if there's areas that are more, um, give you more hope than others as we start the year. Wow, that's a tough one. Marcella, you wanna give me a hand there? That was gonna be my closer for David, who I understand, unfortunately, his computer has uh, died is completely down and it sounds like uh, he's not going to make it back unfortunately in the time that we have. Um, so everyone think on that. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm not sure what's going on there uh, in Berkeley, but uh, we certainly enjoyed that talk. Uh, I've got a really wonderful queue of questions and we'll put together a summary and maybe David would be willing, I'm sure he will, uh, to provide some narrative uh, responses to these questions. And we'll be happy to share those out with everyone after. So glad we got through the full presentation uh, and we'll just give you a few minutes back of your time today um, and appreciate as always, everyone uh, joining the Third Coast Water Seminar. I will also uh, share my screen back uh, momentarily here just to let you know that we have an upcoming, whoops, let's see. Uh, we have our next Third Coast Water Seminar coming right up here on February 24th. And the presenter will be Dr. Paul Westerhoff from Arizona State University talking about chemical-free water treatment, a very important area of uh, research. And as always, uh, we're just so happy to have you all here. Uh, As Current is powered by partnerships. So to everyone here that's a partner on the Third Coast Water Seminars, thank you for making uh, this great series reality. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we are always looking for new partners to come and join uh, the this water party that we're having all the time here at Current. So uh, for more information about how to get involved in this event and other event series that we have coming up in 2021 in pilot projects, uh, many ways to partner, contact George Burgandy, my colleague. Uh, his information is right up here on the screen and we will see you at the next Third Coast and the next current event. So take care everyone.